Hi, my name is Lisbeth Melendez Rivera. I am the Director of Faith Outreach and Training at the Human Rights Campaign. For those of you who still wonder what that equal sign means, uh, we are the largest civil rights LGBTQ organization in the country. And our mission is to work for a world in which our lives as lesbian, gay, bi, and trans people are protected, are recognized, and are honored and respected. But that's not what I'm here to, tell, to talk to you about. I am here to talk to you about a particular journey of faith I happen to have gone through about a few months ago. My life story started in a little island in the middle of a big ocean surrounded by a lot of water that Christopher Columbus called San Juan Bautista and that eventually became Puerto Rico. There I was born to a deeply Catholic family. So Catholic that my father still today goes to mass every day, 4 a.m. Bless his heart. I go to mass, but not at 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> um, and somewhere along the line, I, like many of my compatriotas, made a journey from that little island to the main, what you know, what you will call the main line, what I call this country over here from that country over there. My story is a migration story. It's not an immigration story because some guy named Jones in 1917 decided that in order to protect United Stadiums, and yes, I know that is not a word in English, but it's certainly Estadounidenses is one in Spanish. Um, so that Estadounidenses didn't go to Germany, into Europe during World War I, Boricuas, Puerto Ricanos, were made citizens. That came with a lot of complications. The reward was citizenship. The complications were many. Why do I start there? Why do I start in this place of the past? When I started at the beginning with the, my first sentence being, I am from Puerto Rico. Well, and this is my faith journey. Faith as a Catholic is complicated. As a queer Catholic, that's a little bit more. And yet, every day when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I know is not that I'm a woman, is not that I don't quite look the way you think a woman should look. It's not that I speak every day a language that is not my natural one. It is that I was born in a small island in the middle of the ocean and that my ancestors were mighty. My ancestors came from all over the Caribbean with our homelands being at the mouth of the Amazon, otherwise known as the Arawak people. In Puerto Rico, we call them Tainos. But they were also part of the Caribs and other tribes that were displaced starting in 1492. When that displacement or elimination was finished, we were joined by our siblings from the African continent. Particularly because in Puerto Rico, just as with many East islands in the West Indies, we became the place, the stop, where folks were to be broken, com made compliant. The majority of the folks who came over during the slave trade had religion. Now, back up for a second and tell you that the Arawak people had a very deep practice. It was an earth-based practice. We understood what the, what the gifts of the sun and the sea and the land could give us. As a matter of fact, what you guys call barbecue is a, is a translation, is an anglicism of a word that in Taino is red barbacoa. 
And for us, barbacoa was a pit in the sand full of plantain leaves that will burn and cook our fish and give it an amazing flavor. To that, then, we added the practices of the peoples of Africa. And I want to be clear that we understand that the peoples of Africa, it was not just about the Yoruba religion. The places from which our people came from, from Africa, were also Muslim and highly educated. And that is the reason why they needed to be broken. Because they already understood mathematics and geometry. They knew how to navigate their land and their seas. And that did not serve the master well. Again, I come from a people of resistance with a deep faith, a diverse faith. The folks who staffed those invading ships, for the most part, came running away from the Inquisition. Now, who amongst you knows who ran from the Inquisition? Muslims and Jews. So here we are with this small description of what the spiritual journey of the people of Puerto Rico has been. The island of Boriquen was not just the almighty doctrine of discovery, go and conquer. That my Catholic church forced onto the world. My family faith journey is one that comes from many strands, from many places, and whose culmination today looks like me. Somebody who can embody what I believe our brother came to do, and yet understands that it's not as simple as what was put in the thing we call the Bible. So that's somebody's version of events. We've, we know we've built an entire set of practices based on that book. But reality is that theology and faith are much more than scripture. It's the combination of our practices, is the practice of our convictions, is that place that makes us understand that you and I might differ, but at the end of the day, there is that one nugget. And that is a lot part of the history of Puerto Rico. We don't all agree. If you read the newspapers here, or at least your tablet, they will tell you that the people of Puerto Rico today want to become a state. I beg to differ. Strongly. 17% of the people of Puerto Rico do not speak for me because they keep citing this last plebiscite. Um, we know, you know, we know that there are things we need because as an island, there's not a lot that we produce. Uh, even in the best of our days, our production was based on agriculture and then the import of industrial goods, such as technology, pharmacy, chemistry. And what does all of that have to do with faith? Well, the part that has to do with faith is that we actually understand and believe that we work for the better good and that also, in that sense, the lulling that faith brings to us that we pray that these jobs stays with us so that we can survive. And that we pray that God brings wisdom to our politicians so that we can live and we can breathe. And our history is much more complicated than that. It took me an hour and a half to explain Puerto Rican history just two days ago and I'm trying to condense it in, oh, 10 minutes. And our history is 500 years long, not 200. I'm sorry, was it 234, something like that? 47, yeah, there you go. So we have twice the history that you do. And there's been ups and there's been downs. 
And mostly, in the last 50 years, there's been a lot of pain. A lot of pain that has made us stronger as people and yet weaker as a nation. The financial crisis is the exodus of people and of goods is left the people of Puerto Rico disheartening. And yet we pray. We pray. Now, let me back up for a second around this prayer thing. Like I said, we were colonized under the doctrine of discovery, so, you know, Catholics kind of had the ownership of the island for a little bit. That's about 1917, after the invasion of Puerto Rico by the United States in 1898 as a price of war, having won the war against Spain. Now, I'm not 100 precision, I would say won the war as much as negotiated themselves out of it where the prize was the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Throw one American Samoa on the side for dessert, and we have a deal. So now we have, oh God, this bunch of unruly people out there, but they have strong faith, and we really should do something about this to our favor. So why don't, invite, why don't we invite all of the denominations in the United States, all of the Protestants, the real religion, and I'm just giving you the narrative as it, as it was spoken. No, I'm, this, no, I'm not complaining about Protestants. I'm amongst you. I get you. Um, and they decided that the best way to do this was twofold. The first one was that they will bring Protest, you know, a strong Protestant faith to Americanize the people of Puerto Rico. And that could only be done at the church with the right set of preachers. And if we're just not all the same, then we can divide people enough not to speak to one another and fight division. We work over here and the people are uh, kind of working their way through it. So the disciples of Christ and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Methodists. Who am I missing? Seven of the Protestant denominations, as we know them. American Baptist, not American Baptist, by the way. So I just want to be clear because it was 1917, a little bit before the whole, like, we're going to leave. You know, it was just one Baptist church. Um... They divided the island into seven regions. And each region got owned by a denomination. So what practice, what you practice in Puerto Rico depends on where you live, right? So if you are a Protestant who was brought up Protestant in Puerto Rico and you grew up in Bayamón, you're Baptist. No, I'm sorry. You're disciples of Christ. One town over, you're Methodist. In Dorado. And if you're in Peñuelas in the south, south uh, west side of the island, uh, you're Baptist. Methodists have the center. Uh, the Presbyterians have the southeast. And you'll notice, because you'll drive around this 3,500 square piece of land, and it's like all of a sudden you'll see just like, you'll be driving, and it's like first Baptist, second Baptist, third Baptist, and all of a sudden it's like, First covenant of the disciples of Christ. And like, you literally see it as you drive through the towns where the lines of division are because all of a sudden the churches change. Right? The Jehovah Witnesses decided they wanted the whole thing. They really try. And, you know, like we say here in the South sometimes, God bless them. They actually tried to get a hold really in the middle of the island in the mountainous regions because it was easier for them to be left alone because communications at that time, it was harder to get in there. And so my mother grew up in the, in the mountain region of Puerto Rico and she, they used to have, uh, you know, she, my grandparents would rent the bottom part of their house in the two-story house in the middle, in the, in the center of town. And my mother would hear the CV radio of the Jehovah Witnesses communicating with the Jehovah Witnesses here in the United States, planning about how, they, how many houses they were going to hit the next day and so on. And my, again, you know, my family is incredibly Catholic, and so it was like, 
who are these demons and what are they doing in my house? Um, so, again, through all of that, you also have our native practices. You also have the bastardization of Catholic uh, practices. Why? Because when you try to impose something on our people, we will twist it so that you are pleased, and so are we. <laughs> that practice became known as Santeria. And it's common in almost every Caribbean island. Santer Santeros are strongly based in Cuba and Puerto Rico, which is where you know most of our slaves uh, really uh, strengthen their faith by acquiescing to names. And so um, I'll give you a funny tidbit. Uh, you know, what, one of the things that Santeros did is that they took the Yoruba deities and then they gave him Catholic names. So, and, and most corresponded, you know, like Yemaya, which is the goddess of, of ocean and water, became La Caridad del Cobre, La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre. Uh, but it's funny thing, it's like the son of Yemaya became the daughter of Yemaya when they did the translation. So Changó, just the son of Yemaya, fire and, and headstrong and, you know, became Santa Barbara. Fighter, defender, still fiery ass. But I always say, it's funny that I am in Yoruba tradition, the daughter of the first trans god, you know, deity because in the Catholic Yoruba, because, you know, as the daughter of Chango, I have, I represent that. I look at you in the world as a born female whose gender presentation might not quite acquire like what you think I should look like. And that's kind of like Chango and Santa Barbara's issue, right? It's like, ah, today I have a dress and a sword. Tomorrow I'll just strike you with my ball of fire, you know. And on top of that, I'm a Taurus. Don't even start me. Um... So, <laughs> all of these religions, you know, get through, and that affects the way, even as the, we, we, how we look at politics, because these are the leaders that are telling us how we relate to the United States, how do we relate to the independentista movement, and how do we remain as a colony, I'm sorry, as a territory of the United States. And so that piece, sorry, I'm raising my voice because my ears are listening to the music, and so if you feel me screaming, I apologize. Um, so more so than you, more so than ever, you know, we saw that weaving in and out and the merging of the state and church. We did not codify like Mexico or the Central America or Colombia did, where there was no separation, but things don't happen in Puerto Rico in government unless the church says something about it. Right? So all of a sudden, we, we kind of flipped the table for those of us who are troublemakers. And we said, we're going to create dissent in the church so that we can get the legislation we need passed. <laughs> uh, because we needed, to, we needed the voice of justice, the voice of faith, to hold our legislation accountable for the decisions they were not making that were killing our people. And that has been an ongoing problem. And the culmination of that problem came 10 months ago, on September 20th, 2017. Let me back up for a second. These decisions meant that our infrastructure was crumbling, that our bridges, the same things that are happening here, these bridges are dying, you know, they're crumbling, our buildings, our, our uh, elect electric grid is, you go, Oh, there goes the island for another five, five weeks. Great. So, right, so we are, like, literally we're crumbling. This is not a metaphor. This is, this is reality. And in the meanwhile, our governor and the legislature and politicians are trying to decide if they want to have one more plebiscite to decide if we want to become a state, become independent, or stay as we are. Really? We want to spend another $80 million when that could really fix at least five or six bridges? Maybe a new power plant, some solar, no, no, solar, no, no, okay. And 
we started making some changes as, you know, as people started to think about it, but the conversations began to happen too late. On September 12th, Irma, a little bit in, earlier in September, I can't remember the exact date, Hurricane Irma hit the island. Now, it didn't directly hit the island. It literally went by. It was like, hey, girl, as a Category 5. We got the outer edges of Irma, and that took out 60% of our electricity. 60% of the electricity in the island when a hurricane wind just, what up, got to go. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. So the government of the United States and FEMA, and I, this is not a complaint, by the way, uh, because I, under, I, I understand some of it, not all of it. In all their FEMA wisdom, who really remembers Katrina, took all of the blue tarps, all the water, all the supplies they had, and went to and sent them to the British Virgin Islands and the U.S. Virgin Island of St. Thomas that Irma had indeed hit. Right, so they helped with one of their other territories and then were generous enough to help the British government with their colonies in the Caribbean. Not a moment was given to think that we're in the middle and the height of the hurricane season. We might get another one. This is as Harvey is hitting Houston. You have two. Now, two Category 5, right? Hurricanes churning in the Atlantic. In a matter of five days, that will become three. And for a second, there was four. And you don't think any of these are going to kind of drop below latitude 18.7? All right. I'm so glad you read, because, wow, you can really predict. Mm. So on September 19th, I boarded a plane in Puerto Rico at the urging of my mother who sent away message to me was leave because somebody has to remember us if we die. I had to get on a plane. The last thing I wanted to do and left my entire family in Puerto Rico. The most horrifying flight takeoff that I have ever had. Not just because I was emotionally destroyed, but because the winds of Maria had just started kind of giving us a preview. So for the first 20,000 feet of my flight, it was like this. Now I'll tell you, I am also a daughter of the rosary. It is where, how I meditate, is how I center. I don't think I've played all three mysteries Oh, you know, like all three rosaries, you know, Catholics in the room. So, you know, we, we have 15 mysteries that are divided in group of five. And, um, well, four, 20 if you really want to count what John Paul did. But anyway, not used to that yet. But in reality, so for those of us who are truly indoctrinated, they are 15. And each of them hits a stage of the cross. It hits, you know, a, a significant moment in the gospel that helps you meditate, that helps you rethink, and that helps you center in your faith through the voice of Maria. Because the rosary is a Maria thing. And, you know, and I am a devout Maria. I, I love the mother of Christ. I actually think that she deserves a hell of a more credit than anybody gives her. As the first prophet, as the, as the person who really said, now, they, you know, it's like, this is my son, Anne, Anne, who, um, who was the first person to say to Jesus, I don't care, you're afraid, you go turn that water into wine, and you help these folks. All right, let's just be clear. We know Christ because his mother said, I am telling you to go do that. D don't look at me that way, go. <laughs> don't embarrass me in public, I'll get you at home like a good Jewish woman would. And so we, you know, I get in the plane and I come home and for the next 48 hours, I lived 
in fear that I would never hear from my family again. Because all I could see on the TV was the horrible images that David Bagnoa was courageous enough to capture. I had done one thing well before I left the island, and that was my father's a pack rat. He says stuff from like, the, you know, like 1970s. I'm like the founding of his business. I'm like, really? You retired 15 years ago. Do you really need this paper? Don't touch it. Put it in the file again. I'm like, okay. But knowing that, I went to his closet. If you want to call it that, I'm not sure that's exactly. But I went to his closet, and I knew somewhere, because he's had every cell phone that he's ever owned is still in that drawer. I'm like, if you still have every cell phone you've ever owned, I bet you you have a rotary phone somewhere in here. And good enough, my dad had a rotary phone. <laughs> so he also had one of those initial, mom, you know, like Mama Bell, like, touch tone. So I really didn't want to put them through the whole rotary thing. So I took that clunky, big, beige phone with the buttons you push really hard. And I said, look, this is first on your list. There are things that we, the people of the ocean, know. You fill your tub with water, right? You take as many buckets outside and you tie them to the wall so that they don't fly away so you have something to flush your toilet with. Either that or you live near a river, either. <laughs> and you make sure your landline works. Because when the electricity goes, all modern things go. I still have a phone. Yeah, see, there's no electricity, so you can't call from that phone because you have to take it, battery not working. There has to be electricity. Like the concept that you need electricity to go connect one thing to the other sometimes escapes us. So I took it out, and you know we had a neighborhood uh, meeting, and my friends started laughing, 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 laughing about, um, the hell is that thing? I was like, Dad, my dear, my niece, my niece was six, who just turned 16 yesterday. He says, Titi, ¿qué es eso? You know, I'm like, what's that? I was like, that's a phone. She's like, what? I'm like, that's a phone. But what do you mean? Like, do you have to stay next to that thing to talk? I'm like, yep, it has a cord. <laughs> and this one has an extra long cord so you can go to the kitchen and back while you're talking. It's awesome. <laughs> She's like, can you do anything else with that? I said, nope. You pick up the phone. You call. If it beeps because there's call waiting, you have to carefully hit the thing so that you don't hang up on people. And then you go, hello, is this still the person or do I have another, you know? And if you really want to go back, you have to hit the thing and say, uh, operator, can you please connect me? She's like, what? I said, yeah, there was a time we had to talk to somebody to get to somebody. So everybody made fun of it, but the reality is that after 48 hours, phone service, which by the way is the first thing that gets restored when there's an emergency, because it's the only way in which people go in, and most phone lines in this country are subterranean versus electrical grids. Now I'll get to electrical grid in a second because it's important to my story. So my parents were able to call and I knew they were okay. But those in 48 hours prior to that phone call, I spent vacillating between the fetal position in my living room and the Catholic church a few blocks down where I sat and I prayed and I meditated and I tried to figure out how to breathe right, because I needed to breathe. And so my instinct was, okay, you're alive, I'm gonna get in a plane, I'm gonna go, well, uh, there's no place to go, there's no planes, there's no anything. And at that moment I said, you know, my, my housemate who's also Boricua, and I looked at each other, it was like the first chance that we get, we're gonna get home. Because the diaspora is strong and we, are, it, 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 we can do this. We can help our own. Because nobody else is, we already knew nobody else was going to help us. We had seen Katrina. We'd seen other disasters in the country. And if it hit a particularly group of group people of color, we knew we were going to be last on the list. And what is Puerto Rico but a bunch of brown people? Thank God we're brown. Because, you know, we don't burn as easily. It's just a good thing. But, but we knew what the reaction was going to be, and so we started working with churches, we started working with radio stations, we started to send 
supplies and help and food in ways in which was not the ways in which I bet most of you did. I'll give you an example. I am lucky enough my brother works for Goya products. Please buy Goya. I need my nieces to go to college. Um, but he works at Goya, and so we collected food and water, and we actually uh, asked my brother to make space in a Goya freighter uh, so that it went directly to Goya, and then he could pick it up at the, uh, at the port. So we bypassed the whole system. Because the whole system meant that things went into warehouse where they're still today. They are still, the food and the water that you send are still sitting in warehouses in Miami and in San Juan because the amount of paperwork people needed to get that damn bottle of water out of that, out of that uh, storage into the streets. The other thing that we did was we started looking at our own communities. As a queer Boricua, I knew that my people in Puerto Rico would be the last ones to get help. So we looked for organizations that were going not with the fabulous gay, the one that lived in San Juan or in Ponce or in one of the major, you know, but really in Humacao, in Yabucoa, in Orocovis and Morovis, in the towns in the middle of the islands, in the places where had been hit the hardest, that we knew were not going to get help. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that, as you probably know, FEMA will only help those who, own, who have a property deed. So in order for you to claim FEMA, you have to have a property deed. You have to prove that where you live is yours. Or you have to have your landlord prove that you, know, you are authorized to live in that place. Now, one of the ways in which as people of color we survive, and poor people, working class people we survive, is that you know, we will collectivize our monies, or we'll have that one person in our family who has the means, and we will buy like a five acre piece of land. And then the big house will go in, and then all of a sudden it's like 30 other houses, mm -hmm. right? Everybody gets their 100 yards of like space because that's the only way in which we can have access to land to build our houses, right? So the majority of people in Puerto Rico live in that situation in the rural parts of the area, so they did receive no FEMA help. When you fly into Puerto Rico today, you will still see the sea of blue tarps. And, you know, you have to take a look at your privilege, right? And, and let me go back to the beginning. My privilege is that I am the director of faith outreach at the Human Rights Campaign. I have access to you, and I have access to my organization, and I knew that queer people of faith were ready to be called to service. So in January, we put together a conversation, a dialogue amongst queer people of faith and others here in the United States together with an organization in Puerto Rico called Waves Ahead, who had been serving the rural parts of the island, uh, literally carrying things in their back by horse, by donkey, uh, walking miles and miles with water and food uh, to bring it to those who answered. And so we organized not just our organizations to support our work, but also put together 35 individuals uh, to go rebuild LGBTQ housing in Puerto Rico. My team, there was eight of us, we rebuilt four houses. Now, let, let me tell you what I, what I mean with rebuild. I will be so generous to the people to come to fix my house. Because we not only, we, I'm talking like, you see this platform I'm standing in? The average size of the houses that we built, that we rebuilt, was about the size of this platform. As a matter of fact, Natividad's house, Nati's house, was the bud here to here. This was his living room. That square there was his bathroom. When we go to Nati's house, you're looking at what we saw. There was a cement platform where his house used to be. So we rebuilt his house. Put walls, cement walls, put a roof, we wired, 
We install the windows. We put the plumbing in. We painted. We fixed the landscape. We went to the store and we bought everything he needed. It's the first time that he actually owned a set of dishes because he lived in his brother's family plot where they had given him that piece of cement so that he wouldn't bother them with his queerness. Nati, by the way, is 76. Ricky is one of the other houses that we did. Um, a little bit bigger plot than this, but not by much. Had been a hairdresser in his neighborhood in the mountains. Jibaro de Puerto Rico. Jibaro, by the way, is probably the equivalent of hillbilly, but not doesn't quite translate as that. It's people of the mountain. Are, it's our people, no? And um, Ricky had a fabulous salon. Basically, two chairs to, you know, to do hair, he's like washing, okay? And he served the entire community. Ricky's 53. To say that he doesn't walk, he floats is an understatement. <laughs> he sashes his way through the hood, up and down the mountain. He lives with his parents. His father is bedridden. As a matter of fact, he lives in, this, what we were doing this place is in Umacao, which is next to Jabucoa, where the hurricane came in. Hurricane comes in, takes his, house, his sleeping quarters that are above his mother's house. In the middle of the 100 and 500 and, you know, winds, him and his 75-year-old mother have to take their bedridden father down the stairs into the main house because the house around them is flowing away. It's literally just being ripped apart. So in Ricky's, in Ricky's case, we had 11 family members sleeping in two rooms, the living room and the dining room, because the rest of the house was inhabitable. So we fixed his mother's house, and we built him a new apartment in the back where his, where his hair uh, salon was, and then we took the driveway with, the, with his mother's blessing and made him into his new hair salon. Because Ricky, doing hair earned about $1,000 a month that went to pay for all of his dad, father's needs. And the one thing that his mother said to us when we walked in was, what you do for my son, you do for me, because not even the church that I hope would help me did. It took a bunch of Boricuas living in the United States and, and Britain to come to the island to fix what so many of our churches did not do because we were gay. Because the houses around them had been fixed. But they were good Christians. They were good Christians. And these are the places in which my faith is tested every day. Every day. Because I still know that I am actually a much better Christian than many who claim that label. And so because I want to give you time to ask any questions you have, I'm going to stop. I could speak for probably for another God knows. If you want to hear more, I'm on the convo hall after this at 2. So you're welcome to come and ask me questions there too. But let me open the floor for questions, comments, uh, and speak up and into the mic because I am all too much salsa and merengue. I'm not going to be able to hear you from up here with that background. So go ahead. Um, I'm certain that you have opinions about which organizations you would recommend for those of us who belong to churches who have been considering um, a work trip to Puerto Rico. So there's two organizations that I'll give you. The first one is Intersections International, which is a conglomerate of different practices. They publish also an online blog called Believe Out Loud, which speaks directly to Believe Out Loud, it speaks directly to LGBTQ people of faith. Um, but um, Inter you know, Intersections International was the, was the organization that helped us bring the people from London, the, you know, the diaspora from Europe into the island. And they themselves have done at least four trips to Vieques, Culebra, and the eastern side of the island. And they're in the process right now of still fixing another 10 houses. 
So connect with, you know, it's intersectionsinternational.org, I believe. It could be .com, but I can't remember. So they have a youth ministry, and yes, as a matter of fact, the people who preceded us in the island from Intersection International was a group of high school students. So it, it requires a little bit more, you know, paper, but yes. The second one is an, is an organization that is actually based in Puerto Rico. It's called, the organization I mentioned earlier, Waves Ahead. Waves Ahead's mission is to help, uh, uh, now my leg. You see, this is the problem when you speak two languages, sometimes you can't think of either, and the words just go poof. Uh, to stabilize the financial situation of many people in Puerto Rico so they don't have to access the system. So we have a program uh, on microenterprises, which is how we actually found Ricky because he was a recipient of one of our grants, and that's how he got to build his salon. Um, and so we give seed monies for folks to be able to start their own businesses uh, without having to depend on the government. That just gives them the runaround, and because we're queer, they won't help us, right? Uh, the other piece is the reconstruction that is happening, and that will continue to happen, particularly now that we are reaching the height of the hurricane season for this year. And the last piece of what we do is actually we provide mental health services to communities uh, because the PTSD after an event such as this is such that we now have uh, a $100,000 grant that was given by the government of Puerto Rico exclusively in, in like, you know, ask me in private how we finally got to have that. <laughs> uh, but we got it and we will have now eight centers across the island that will provide 20 hours a week of free mental health service for those who want to access it. And so those are the three pillars of the work that Ways Ahead is doing. Um, I'll give, you know, um, they're, the way into make a donation is super long, so come and see me and I'll give you a better link. But if you look for Waves Ahead Puerto Rico or PR, you should be able to pull it up, okay? And the effort, the reconstruction effort is called hashtag reconstruye coup. I hashtag reconstruction queer, but you know. Yeah, as in the ocean. Yep, no. Back there. Um, I think from your work, like, you're kind of leading the way on intersectionality between queer movement, feminism, immigration, and things like that. And I think I've seen um, a better intersection in the last, you know, recently. Do you have any top line um, advice to keep that going or how we can live that out? Let me see if I get your question. Uh, do you want me to, to, to answer if I have any top lines around intersectionality? That's the bottom line, right? Okay, good. Because I was like, oh, how much am I thinking? Okay. Um, be intentional. Be aware of your privilege. And let me talk for a second on that. I stand before you, and I'll use the parlance of old. It'll make some of you uncomfortable. I'm okay with it. When you look at me, the first thing you see is a Latina butch dyke. That is what I am. I'm Latina. I'm butch, in case you couldn't tell. But me, my beautiful t-shirt doesn't say enough. As you said, butch, I don't know. Um, and I'm a woman who loves women. I'm a dyke. I'm okay with all of that. But I'm also incredibly privileged. I have a job that takes me all over the world. I get to do what I love for a living. That is a privilege most of us don't have. Like, I just don't go to work. I go to do the things I love to do. I'm educated, I'm bilingual, and I'm a citizen. When I walk into a space, I cannot just assume that my ethnicity, my, um, I saw you, my ethnicity, my gender, or my gender presentation and sexual orientation is the only thing that you will see for me. I'm educated, you know, like all of those things. So always be aware of what you bring into the space because even the most oppressed of us in this country still have privilege. And we have to be aware, and it's relative to who we're with, but we still have it. So we cannot always lead with like what I call um, the doorbell syndrome. I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed. <laughs> Because in some instances, we're better off than somebody else, right? 
So privilege is relative, but always be aware of it. And <clears throat> continue to educate yourself. Look at who surrounds you, who you live with, who you're in relationship with. Uh, one of my biggest complaints is so many times I go to spaces where they're like, oh, you know, I'm like, I have a diverse life. I really lean into my deconstructing white supremacy and, you know, I like anti-racism. I said, so who are your friends? And every single one of them, Lily White. I'm like, how, where did you get your knowledge? Where do you get your feedback? Where's your accountability? Which brings me to my last point. Be accountable and be transparent. Intersectionality is a great buzzword. If you do not somebody to whom you can say, did I do that okay? And I catch myself having to ask that question. There are people in this audience to whom I will go later and say, was that okay? Did I miss something? Should I have said something? I have about two minutes left, and I, you know, unless there's one more question, I really, there's one more thing I need to say. When you go to Intersections International or Waves Ahead or anything else, do me a favor. Understand that my privilege as a Boricua is that we're larger than the US, U.S. Virgin Islands, from whom you have heard nothing. Our brothers and sisters in the U.S. VI are suffering. The island of St. John will take at least another 50 years to be repopulated. And St. Croix is not that far behind. St. Croix has no electricity, and the island of St. Croix is run by four major generations that take shifts in four-hour blocks, leaving people without electricity for big chunks of the day. In our islands, no electricity means no water because there is no, you know, we need pumps. So please be aware that as much as I want you to hear about the plight of Puerto Rico, as much as I want you to go to your churches and help us outside of the system to get what we need, we are not the only ones. And so we will move forward to continue to work together, right? We, I closed my stay in Puerto Rico during uh, LGBTQ Pride. I marched with eight welcoming and affirming church, you know, congregations that I have helped shepherd through that, through that um, journey. And our brothers from the U U U brothers and siblings from the U.S. Virgin were there with us. And so know that we collaborate, know that we work. Don't let them get lost in the narrative that is just about Puerto Rico. Because I would not be accountable to them if I didn't remind you that we are not the only territory in the Caribbean. So I think my time is up. Am I right on that? I think my time is up. Again, I'm moving to the tent convo hall number nine. So if you have any other questions, any comments that you feel you didn't want to do here, because follow me, come with me. And again, thank you for a great goose. <laughs>